This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. How many people watching right now? If you're really honest with yourself, you are angry at somebody about something. And as long as you use the excuse that it's too hard, you'll never be able to forgive. Thank you for joining me today on Enjoying Everyday Life. Today I'm going to be teaching on the subject of offense. So many people today are angry at someone about something. I would venture to say that there's probably more people that are angry about something or offended than those that are not. And yet, the Bible warns us over and over and over about the dangers of being offended. And so, I'm praying that your eyes will be open today, that you would see any area in your life where maybe you're offended and you don't even realize that you are. Sometimes I think we can get things stuck on the inside of us and they've been there so long we just have lived with it to the point where it becomes normal for us or natural. And sometimes we make so many excuses for our anger, but we have to realize that it's never justified no matter what somebody's done to you your anger, your unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, being offended, it's never justified simply because God tells us not to do it. And I want you to keep in mind that God never tells us to do anything unless it's going to be something that's going to be good for us. And actually, I teach over and over that when you forgive someone who's hurt you, you're really not doing them a favor, you're doing yourself a favor. Because when we harbor unforgiveness towards someone, it eats away at us. It's like offense is like having a little bit of pepper in your salt. It's like it's, it's just kind of there nipping away at you. And you go through life and you can smile at the person and make all the niceties, but down deep inside, there's something that's really bugging you. And the first thing I want you to realize is that you're always going to have opportunity to be offended. Maybe every day. One time I challenged people to take a week and count how many opportunities they had to be offended. And one girl came back and said 40, and that's probably just a normal number. You can get offended in traffic, you can get offended in the grocery store, you can get offended at work, you can get offended in the family. Anytime we're going to be dealing with people that are different than we are and people who make mistakes, the same as we make mistakes, there's going to be an opportunity for offense. But this is an opportunity that we don't want to take advantage of. Matter of fact, the Bible says don't take offense. And I love that. Satan's going to offer it to us, and he's going to offer it to us often. But just because somebody offers you poison, that doesn't mean that you have to take it. So, offense, if you study the word in the Greek, original Greek, it comes from a Greek word pronounced scandalon. And this is actually what, what it says the definition is. It's the name of... Scandalon, translated offense, is the name of the part of the trap on which the bait hung that lured the animal into the trap. So it would be like the cheese on the mouse trap. You're not going to catch a mouse in a trap if there's nothing on that trap to lure them in. And Satan wants to trap us. He wants to trap us in misery and he wants to get us trapped in a place where we're out of the will of God, but either aren't aware of it or we feel like we can't do anything about it. And so offense would be like the cheese on the mouse trap. It's what Satan uses the fence to draw us into 
deeper problems. And offense, if it's not dealt with promptly, can turn into some very bad things. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, even hatred. We're not only supposed to forgive, we're supposed to forgive frequently and quickly. There are scriptures that say both. And the quicker we forgive, the easier it is to do it. One of the ways to be able to forgive is to believe the best of people or to maybe try to understand where they're coming from. You know, there's always two sides to every story, and when somebody does something that hurts us, we understand what they did to us, but we don't know their heart. We don't know what's going on in their heart. Many times we don't know how they were raised in their childhood, and, and so they may have hurts and things going on on the inside of them. It's causing them to do the things they did or behave the way they behave. You know, you may go to the store and get a grouchy clerk, and that can be offensive to you because you're spending your money there. You would expect them to be nice to you. But what may, I don't know, maybe they've had a loved one die recently and they're doing all they can do to stand there and run the cash register. It's good if we try to believe the best of people and instead of getting so bothered about the way they're treating us, maybe consider what they're doing to themselves. I love what Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Isn't that interesting? Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You know, the Bible says if Satan would have realized what he was doing, he would have never had the Son of God crucified. He didn't really realize what he was doing. He thought he was hurting Jesus, but actually... He was setting the world free. Same time, same thing, a lot of times when people do something to us, they don't know what they're doing. Maybe we're not, they're not trying to hurt us. That's not the object of what they're trying to do. We just got in their way on a day when things were difficult for them. Now, I know there's all different kinds of things that different ones of you have gone through, and I'm sure some of you have been hurt very deeply. I was sexually abused by my father. My mother knew about it and didn't know how to help me. She was too weak in her personality to confront my dad and know how to help me, so she ignored the situation, and it brought some very deep hurts into my life. I married the first young man that came along. He ran around with other women. That was another five years of agony. So I know what it's like to be hurt, and I know that it can be challenging to forgive people that have hurt you, but the first thing, if we're ever going to forgive, we have to believe it's possible. We can't keep talking about how hard it is because even though God calls us to do hard things, he always gives us enough grace to do what he has asked us to do. So if there are any of you watching today and you think, well, I just, I can't forgive. It's just, it's too much. It's not fair. It's not right. Well, Jesus taking our sin wasn't fair and it wasn't right. Him forgiving us for our sins against him was not fair, but he did it. He did it anyway. And we need to follow his example and we need to do it anyway. I'm very concerned about all the people in the world today that are angry. We live in such an angry world and boy... I just feel like I need to just keep preaching on this in different ways until people get it. I told somebody yesterday, I was with somebody in the car, and we were talking about just how upset, how easily people get upset. And, I mean, you know what it's like driving in traffic. I mean, you make one teeny tiny little mistake, and the person in the other car is ranting and raving and carrying on like you're the worst person that ever lived. And it's like people don't give you any room today to make mistakes. They're forgetting that they make mistakes all the time, that they want mercy for, but yet they don't want to give mercy when they need to give mercy. And we were talking about something that had happened that had upset someone, and, 
And, you know, of course, I've lived for quite a while now, and so I've gone through all those phases of getting upset and getting my feelings hurt. And I've, I've learned, actually, I really have learned this, and learning takes a long time. So when somebody tells you, I've learned this, it's worth listening to them because maybe if you do, you can save yourself a lot of years of agony. And I've learned that being upset about something you cannot do anything about is totally, completely useless. I've also learned that trying to make other people be what you want them to be and getting angry with them if they won't is also useless because only God can change people and people are only going to change if they want to change. Not because you want them to change, but because they want to change. And I can promise you today that if you will try giving people more mercy and a, a, and a lot less harsh judgment, your life is going to be very much better. You're going to be a much happier person. So Satan uses offenses, sometimes even little things. Sometimes we get a bunch of little, little things stored up on the inside of us. And because we haven't let them go, all these little things pile up and they become big things. And Satan uses offenses as bait to lure us into a lifetime of bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and even hatred. But God calls us to love one another and to let our love be red hot, on fire, intense, abounding, always growing. Because love, if we walk in love, that's the one thing that will prevent the devil from being able to control us or to derail or ruin or destroy the wonderful destiny that God has planned for us. God has an amazingly good plan for your life, but you can ruin it by holding unforgiveness towards someone. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, The devil roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking whom he may devour. But I just want to tell you today, it doesn't have to be you. Just because he's roaming around looking for whom he can devour, you don't have to take his bait and let it be you. I would really love it if everybody watching today would make a decision. I'm going to really be careful from now on about getting angry and staying angry. Sometimes we get angry so fast, it's like somebody does something, I'm angry. Well, the Bible doesn't say that we're to never get angry. It says when you're angry, don't sin. When you're angry, don't let the sun go down on your anger. So God understands that. He understands our emotions. He understands our feelings. He gives us a space of time to work through it. And one of the quickest ways to work through being anger, being angry is to understand that we all do things that hurt other people. And boy, if we don't learn how to forgive one another, we're never going to be able to get along with anybody. If you continue... In the Vine's definition, it also says that offense is a hindrance or a stumbling block. What does that mean? It means that you, it hinders your walk with God and it becomes a point of stumbling. You can be walking along, making progress in your walk with God, and then Satan launches an attack of offense or bitterness or unforgiveness against you. And if you don't resist it, and quickly move beyond it, it will become a stumbling block in your walk with God and you can actually stop growing in your relationship with Him because of it. When we allow the spirit of offense to come in, it becomes a hindrance and a stumbling block in our walk and our relationship with God. And some of you, oh, even maybe little things like you say, I, just, I, I don't feel like I've felt God's presence in a long time or I don't, I don't feel like God's answering my prayers. Well, you know, there's scripture that says that God can't answer our prayers until we forgive the people that we're holding things against. It's very, very plain in the Bible. Matter of fact, 
It says if you don't forgive others their trespasses against you, neither will your Father in heaven forgive yours. I don't think that we take some of these things seriously enough. We just keep going over and over how we feel about what somebody did to us. And, you know, I'm just wondering while I'm teaching this message today, how many people watching right now, if you're really honest with yourself, you are angry at somebody about something. And as long as you use the excuse that it's too hard, you'll never be able to forgive. Let me just give you a couple of hints. The way to forgive people is God's way. And he says, pray for your enemies. <laughs> so that's the very first thing that you do is you pray. And yes, you pray for them to be blessed. And you think, well, I don't want my enemies to be blessed. Well, the first thing God will bless people with is truth. It's not like if you pray for your enemies to be blessed, they're going to get a new house and a new car. That's not the kind of thing God's talking about. Maybe if you pray for them, instead of judging them and criticizing them, God can open their eyes and they can change. And the Bible says to bless your enemies and do not curse them. And bless in this context means to speak well of and curse means to speak evil of. So when somebody has hurt us, we want to be careful how we talk to other people about them. Mark chapter 4, verse 17 of course, Mark chapter 4 is a chapter in the Bible that talks about how the sower sows the seed into different kinds of ground and how that seed either does or does not take root and grow. And the seed is the Word of God, the sower is the Holy Spirit, and our heart is the ground that the Word is sown into. So, we want to get honest with ourselves and decide what kind of heart do I have. So he's talking about a group of people here. Verse 17, they have no real root in themselves. In other words, they have no depth. You know, there's a lot of shallow Christians. They go through the motions. They go to church. They put a little money in the offering plate. They might even do a little good works every now and then, but the truth of the matter is, is they're a little bit shallow. And one of the things that happens when a Christian is shallow is they're good until there's a problem. <laughs> and then they don't know how to continue to behave in a Christian manner when things aren't easy anymore. They have no real root in themselves, and so they endure for a little while but when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, see, when, when we're studying the word, Satan's going to come against us. He's going to find a way to come against us. And one of the ways that he does come against us and try to distract us and, and cause us to lose our focus is by getting us upset about something or somebody. When trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, they immediately are offended. <laughs> Wow. Become displeased, indignant, resentful, and they stumble and they fall away. Now, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines offense in some other words that we'll be real familiar with. To displease, well, how long can you be around somebody and them not displease you in some way? Usually not very long. Somebody was telling me just the other day about a family they know that every time there's any kind of little bit of a rift in the family, they all just want to hash it over and talk about it and talk about it and talk about it and keep talking about it and going over and over and over it. And he said, I don't know how people can live like that. He said, my family was together on Christmas and some little thing happened toward the end of the day and we just talked about it for a few minutes, got over it, and everybody went home happy. Well, that's what we can do if we're determined to do things God's way. To displease, to make angry, to affront, it expresses a little bit less than angry than anger without modifying the word. 
it's nearly dis synonymous with displeased. We are offended by rudeness, incivility, harsh language. Children offend their parents by disobedience, and parents offend their children by unreasonable austerity or restraint, sternness or restrictions. Actually, many things offend us, and we are offended far too easily and far too often. But love is not touchy. 1 Corinthians 13 says love, come on, love, we're supposed to be lovers. God is love. We have his spirit in us. Love is not touchy or easily offended. One of my confessions over my life is I am impossible to offend. Now, I used to be a very touchy person, and, you know, a lot of times insecure people are like that. They want you, they give you the job of making them feel good about themselves all the time, and nobody can live under the strain of that for too long. I was like that in the beginning years of my marriage to Dave. I always wanted him to make me feel good about myself, but we, we have to get that from God. We need to stop trying to get from people what we can only get from God. Love is not easily offended. It is not touchy. We should determine, be very determined that we are not going to live with offense in our heart and that we're going to do everything we can to keep it out. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Keep your heart right before God. Philippians 1, 9 and 10 Paul prayed this for the Philippian church. And this I pray that your love might abound yet more and more. I love that. We, we never love enough. We always keep growing in love. And I pray that you might approve the things that are excellent and that you might be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. My goodness. Paul prayed for them that they would make it all the way until Jesus came back to get them without letting offense get in their heart. You know, being angry at people is hard work. I just, I don't, I don't have the energy for it anymore. I'd much rather release a person to God and let him do what he needs to do and let God work with me to change me. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they who love your law. Nothing shall offend them or make them stumble. Isn't it amazing it's really, it's just downright amazing how much the Bible says about not being offended. And I don't think that there's anybody watching right now that doesn't have an opportunity to be offended on a regular basis. But remember, you don't have to take offense. Just because the devil offers it, you don't have to take it. There are six kinds of offense, and we're going to be talking about offense for the two days after this one. Taking offense, giving offense, being offended by the truth, being offended at God, offending the Holy Spirit, and offending yourself by sinning against your own conscience. But you know, the Bible says that there will be no offense in heaven. Offense builds a stronghold of cold love, and that's exactly what Satan wants. Matter of fact, one of the signs of the end times, which we all say we believe we're living in the last days, and I think every Christian that's ever lived always thinks they're living in the last days. Paul thought Jesus was coming back very soon. And I think we should all live as if we believe he's coming back this evening or before tomorrow, Let you know, Let's be ready when Jesus comes back to get us. Let, let's don't, oh goodness, now I need to try to get ready. I want to I live ready. And one of the ways I do that is by keeping offense and bitterness and resentment out of my heart. And I had to learn how to do this. I had to stop saying it was too hard. I had to stop saying I couldn't. I had to stop saying it's not fair. You don't realize what they did to me. God finally gave me the grace to forgive my mom and my dad completely and to take care of them in their old age until they went home to be with him. And 
as a result of God giving me the grace to show my father love, he ended up giving his heart to the Lord, and I know that he's in heaven. Hating people, being angry at them, continuing to bring up to them their offenses, never does you or anybody else any good. Matthew 24 says that in the last days, many will be offended. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. There's so often in our lives when we say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Well, what should you do when you don't know what to do, when you've got a problem and you don't know what to do? What you should do is keep doing what you do know how to do. There's really a lot in that if you think about it. Well, welcome to Enjoying Everyday Life. I'm glad that you've joined us, and I believe that what you're going to hear today will help you enjoy your life more. In Matthew chapter 5, there's a sermon, a group of sermons called the Sermon on the Mount. That's how we refer to it, or the Beatitudes. And they're character traits that Jesus talked about where he said, if we have those character traits or those virtues, there will be a special blessing that comes along with that. And, you know, developing Christ-like or godly character is not always that easy, but it's definitely doable, and it's what God expects out of us. We should want to be Christ-like. That should be one of our number one goals as believers is to not just go to church and know scriptures and maybe do a little church work, but it's really to get out in the world and live the life that Jesus lives so people can not just hear about Jesus, but see him through us. And I, I'm going to talk today about blessed are those who mourn. And that sounds rather odd because you think, well, how could I be blessed if I'm mourning? But you'll see in this teaching that the blessing comes from the fact that when we mourn, God comforts us, and God's comfort is so precious, so amazing, that the, the trouble or the, the, the thing that's made you sad, it's almost worth going through it just to experience God's comfort. And another thing to remember is you, you can't really comfort somebody else in what they're going through if you've never needed God's comfort yourself. So, blessed are those who mourn. Our attitude should be, well, I'm going through something really difficult, but I believe this is going to end well. I'm really hurting right now, but I'm going to bounce back. I'm going to come back. I'm really going through something difficult, but I believe that God works all things out for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If you're going through a difficult time right now, would you do that? Would you say right now, I'm really hurting right now, but this is going to end well? Come on, let's say it together. I'm really hurting right now, but this is going to end well. You see, one thing that we always have as long as we have Christ in our life, is hope. And so no matter what we're going through, the good news is, is we're going through, and we will come out on the other side, and it will come to an end. And the really good thing is, is it can be used by God for character development. If we continue to do the right thing when the wrong thing is happening to us, we grow spiritually during those times. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, a lot of times in life we ask wrong, quest wrong questions. And asking a wrong question 
never brings a satisfying answer. Like most people would ask, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, I've never been able to find a right answer to that. I know people right now that are going through things that are some of the sweetest, most loving, awesome people that you could ever want to know. And yet they're going through something that seems so unjust and so unfair. Well, it's not going to do me any good to ask God, why did this happen to that person? The thing that we, sh that we should ask is instead of saying, why do bad things happen to good people? We should ask, what happens to good people when bad things happen to them? Well, when bad things happen to a good person, if they remain steadfast and continue to do what they know they should do, they will always come out on the other end and there will always be a good takeaway from what they went through that's going to make them a better person. I really believe that. We should ask, what happens to good people when bad things happen to them? Well, number one, they grow spiritually. They bounce back. They become better, not bitter. Let's talk about that for a minute. So many people, when something that seems unfair or unjust happens to them, they get bitter. And bitterness is something you don't want in your life. It poisons everything in your life. Maybe even right now somebody's watching, and to be honest, you're just a little bit mad at God because you've had some trouble in your life that really just doesn't seem fair. Well, instead of being angry at God, trust Him that He's good. He doesn't bring bad things in our life. We have an enemy, the devil, and then there's just all kinds of mean people in the world that just do mean things. But we can trust God to take a bad thing and work it out good. You know why? Because He is the God of justice. He is the God who makes wrong things right. So if you're bitter, angry, resentful, full of unforgiveness, I really pray that you'll work through it with God and you'll let it go so you give Him an opportunity to take that thing that's causing you to mourn and actually let it end up being a blessing in your life. They don't count what they've lost. They count what they have left. Wise people, people that are, that are strong in the Lord, they don't just look at what they've lost. They don't just look at the things that have been bad in their life, but they look at the things that they have left that are good. I heard a good statement just recently, and you may have heard this before, but every day is not a good day, but there's something good in every day. Let's say it again. Every day is not a good day, but there's something good in every day. And boy, your life becomes so blessed when you become the kind of person that looks for those good things, even in the midst of other bad things that are happening to you. When bad things happen to good people, they continue obeying God no matter what they feel like. Mm, that's a good one. You know, a lot of times, I actually did a message one time called, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And there's so often in our lives when we say, well, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Well, what should you do when you don't know what to do, when you've got a problem and you don't know what to do? What you should do is keep doing what you do know how to do. There's really a lot in that if you think about it. So often when we're hurting, we withdraw and we just want to nurse our wounds and we stop going to church, we stop reading our Bible, we stop wanting to do anything for anybody else, we get bitter and resentful, we get confused because we're trying to figure it out. But none of those are the right thing to do. If I have a problem in my life and I don't know what to do, I pray about it, I ask God to show me what I can do if there's anything I can do, but I don't keep trying to do something about something I can't do anything about. I just keep doing what I know to do. And I'll tell you, one of the best things that you can do when you're hurting is continue being good to somebody else. Because I can promise you, no matter how bad you're hurting, there's somebody that's hurting worse than you are. And when bad things happen to good people, they experience the comfort of God. And that's awesome. 
Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Our natural inclination would be to feel that we're blessed when good things are happening to us, not when we have something that we're mourning about. However, it's often the things that we cling to that we actually really need to let go of that separate us from having a deeper relationship with God. There's actually some things, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe you have a friend in your life that really is hindering you from a deeper walk with God. They're either not a believer or they're not as far along as you are spiritually and they're not interested in really going any further. And let's just say this person has been a friend for a long, long time and you can't imagine not having them in your life. And something happens that separates you from them. Let's just say maybe you do something not meaning to that hurts their feelings and they get angry and don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. Well, that can just seem like the most terrible thing in the world, but really maybe losing that relationship is something that you really needed and you wouldn't let it go yourself, so God had to intervene and take it out of your life so you could go on and grow into the person that he wants you to be. I've had things like that happen in my life multiple times, and I'm sure you have too. You know, our perspective on the problems in our life makes all the difference in the world as far as how we're going to handle them. I love Genesis 50, 20. If you don't, if you're not familiar with this story, you certainly need to read it. Joseph had been so mistreated and had so many unjust things happen to him. And at the end of the story, he has an opportunity to get the people back that hurt him. Wow. Now I'm in a position where I can get you back. But see, what you do in that situation shows what kind of character you have. It shows if you have the, the, the attitude that God can bless or if you still have a bad attitude that's going to continue to bring problems into your life. And Joseph had an opportunity to get them back, but instead, the Bible says this, As for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. Actually, all the things that happened to Joseph ended up building character in him and he was put into a very high position in Egypt which allowed him to be able to feed people during a time of famine. And so all the things his brothers had done to him caused him to end up in Egypt. And so he said, you meant it for harm and that wasn't good on their part. But God meant it for good to bring about that many should be kept alive as they are this day. And Joseph said, I'm not going to harm you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to take care of your families because I am not in the place of God. And boy, do we ever need to learn that lesson of letting God be our vindicator and not wasting our time trying to get people back. Now, when people are hurting, one of the things that they tend to do is feel sorry for themselves. At least, I certainly had that problem for a lot of years, and I'm sure that at least some of you do. The foolishness of self-pity, let's talk about that. Well, we can receive the comfort of God if we handle ourselves biblically in trials, but self-pity does not comfort us. We think that we're comforting ourselves. Oh, poor me, everybody mistreats me, this is not fair, nobody does anything for me. My goodness, I remember how many days I wasted in self-pity. And God finally taught me that I couldn't be powerful and pitiful at the same time. And we all want to be powerful people. How about you? Don't you want to be a powerful person, have a powerful life? Well, self-pity is not going to lead you into that. And so one of the things that we must learn if we want to really be a Christian who has mature character, a Christian who is Christ-like. You never see Jesus in the Bible feeling sorry for himself. He never wasted two minutes feeling sorry for himself, and he had all kinds of unjust things happen to him. 
He was accused of things he didn't do, got lied about, he was abandoned, he was betrayed, I, he paid for sins he didn't commit. There were all kinds of unjust things that happened to him, but he never sat around and felt sorry for himself. He just kept doing what God sent him to do. Come on, I want you to get that today. He just kept doing what God sent him to do. And if you're hurting today, God wants to comfort you. But he can't do that if you're full of self-pity trying to give yourself comfort by sitting and thinking about how bad everybody treats you. Self-pity. says all of Jacob's children tried to comfort him concerning Joseph but he refused to be comforted. I think that's kind of an interesting statement. Genesis 37, 35. And his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And you know, sometimes we're like that. It's like you're in a bad mood and you're mad about something or you're hurt and you've been mistreated and somebody comes and tries to cheer you up and you, you're in such a bad state, you don't even want to be cheered up. Now. You would get mad at them if they didn't try to cheer you up, but when they do try to cheer you up, you just keep coming back with more bad reports. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Self-pity is rooted in fear. It's rooted in the fear that we are never going to get what we want. I'm never going to get what I want, and so I'm just going to feel sorry for myself because... I end up being the tail end of everything in life. For example, we will never be loved, we'll never be promoted, we'll never feel physically better, never have more money. Oh, the devil loves the never lies. You're never going to change, you're never going to get promoted, you're never going to have anybody love you, things are always going to be this way. Well, what are some ways that we can recognize self-pity? I think sometimes we can get so um, accustomed to having something in our lives. I mean, I, I can be honest and tell you there were years in my life where my automatic go-to when I didn't get my way was to feel sorry for myself. I didn't get what I wanted, I felt sorry for myself. I didn't get my way, felt sorry for myself. And it took me a long time before I realized that if I didn't get my way, I needed to trust God that maybe I didn't need to get my way in that situation and that what I needed to do was stay happy because I was trying to grow in God and not be a selfish, self-centered person. I want you to ask yourself or spend a little bit of time thinking about how much time do you waste in self-pity. Maybe that's not a problem for you. But if it is, this is an invitation from God to start taking steps toward getting out of that. Don't stay in that trap. What are some ways that we can recognize self-pity? Well, self-pity always wants to blame somebody else for its problems. Be it man or God, someone must be blamed. Self-pity is always negative and pessimistic. It feeds on the assumption of more bad news. It is so sure things will be bad that it almost resents anybody trying to cheer them up. <laughs> if someone says, oh, it won't be that bad, self-pity becomes defensive. Self-pity wants sympathy, and it's usually found talking about the problem. Someone who's full of self-pity, they don't want to talk about anything good, they just want to talk about their problems. And I love this one. Self-pity is always much worse off than anybody else. If you say you didn't sleep good last night, they haven't slept for a week. The person filled with self-pity, if you have a headache, they've had a headache for a week. No matter what you've gone through, everything they've gone through is much worse than anything you've gone through. Self-pity often refuses any advice that it's offered to help them get out of their situation. They think nobody understands them. Nobody understands what they're going through. Nobody's got it as bad as they do. Self-pity makes us insensitive to what other people are going through, so we're not able to have compassion on them. 
Selfishness and self-pity go together. Self-pity is actually an act of selfishness because we turn in on ourselves. God, when we have a problem, God wants us to give our problems to Him, and then He wants us, while we have the problem, to reach out to other people and be a blessing to somebody else, and then that good seed that we sow, God can bring a harvest from, and He'll bring answers into our lives. I hope you understood that. Don't try to fix yourself. Give your problems to God. Not if there's something you can do, do it. But so often we're in situations and we can't do anything about them. And it's frustrating to have a problem that you can't fix. I know because I misfix it. I want to fix it. But boy, I've learned when I have a problem I can't fix, I cast my care on God. I remember Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace that passes understanding shall be yours. Make your request known to God. Tell Him what your problem is. Cast your care on Him so He can take care of you. And then reach out and do something for somebody else. Do something good for somebody else. Then you're sowing a good seed that God can bless and bring a harvest in your life. Your answer is going to come a lot quicker while you're busy about God's business. If you take care of God's business, He will always take care of yours. Self-pity is also governed by self-righteousness. The self-righteous person always has the attitude, well, this shouldn't have happened to me, or I don't deserve this, or how could this happen to me? And you know what? The things that we think about like this, well, how could this happen to me? It can happen to somebody else, and we don't, we don't think that much about it. It's like, well, that's too bad, but, you know, cheer up. God will take care of it. We need to start responding differently to trials and tribulations. It's one of the largest parts of growing spiritually. People who intend to have power with God have to learn how to receive God's comfort. You know, when Jesus left the earth, he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Comforter. The Comforter. And oh, it's so sweet to have the comfort of the Holy Spirit in your life. David prayed this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. That kind of an attitude will be blessed. God wants to comfort you. Are you willing to receive his comfort right now? And you know, I've learned after all these years of walking with God, the first, one of my first responses now to being hurt is to ask God to comfort me. I've learned I can't comfort myself. And to be honest, running to other people, expecting them to comfort me doesn't always work either. You know, I don't think that there's anything harder than you're really hurting and you go to somebody and it's obvious they don't get it at all. They just don't understand at all. But if we go to God for that comfort, God, I'm asking you to comfort me in this situation, then you can receive the comfort that you need. Jeremiah 31, 13 says, Then young women will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. There's a time to mourn, but there's a time then to let it go and go on. In Ecclesiastes, it talks about there's a time for everything. So there's a time to mourn and a time to laugh. A time to be sorrowful and a time to dance. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our trouble so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. Now, you know, hopefully and prayerfully, some of the things that I'm saying to you today or have said are making you feel better. 
maybe you're receiving some hope into your life or you're, you're feeling comforted by knowing that you're not the only one that goes through difficult things. Maybe for some of you it didn't feel too comfortable when I talked to you about self-pity, but it's something that now you've been kind of confronted with and you can get on past that. But you see, I could not even be trying to help you right now if I would have never needed God's help myself. I can only comfort you because I have experienced His comfort in my life. And I want you to have that so you can comfort other people. This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. There's two things that we all have. One of them is one of these. We, we wear that because we don't want to be bothered. You know, don't bother me. And then we all have an excuse bag. We've all got one of these. So if somebody gets past the don't bother me, We've got an excuse ready for, the, for God. Not everything that God asks us to do is convenient, but everything God asks us to do, He does give us the grace to do it. I always say that God gives you the grace for the place. Even like if you're raising a special needs child, I believe that God will give you the grace to do that. I know a young woman that has two special needs children, they're twins, and, and then she has two other boys. And it's, it's amazing what it takes for her to take care of all these kids. And you, you just, you look at people and you think, I don't know how you do it. I just don't know how you do it. Well. People do whatever God wants them to do by the grace of God, which means He gives us the ability to do it. Maybe right now and you're, kind of, you're in kind of a difficult marriage, but you, you believe God wants you to stick it out. Well, you know what? You don't have to be miserable and unhappy the whole time you're in that situation. If you're in the place God wants you to be in, then He'll give you the grace to be in that place. And that means that you can be in an uncomfortable place and still have joy. Come on, there's somebody that I'm trying to talk to this morning. Can you not be comfortable and still be happy? <laughs> I see not too many heads going this way. You're kind of like, mm. yeah, well, I'm not perfect at it either. Remember, I got the revelation a few weeks ago that I don't like being uncomfortable. So if you don't need this message, I'll preach to myself. So, let's talk about Joseph for a minute because I find this to be very interesting. How many of you are someplace in life right now that just doesn't make any sense to you at all? <laughs> Better than half of the people in here. Well, you know, you live life forward, but you understand it backwards. When you're going through stuff, you just don't get it. But later on, you can look back. So many of the things that were so hard for me I look back now and I realize how God had to let that happen. You know, sometimes God will even use people's weaknesses to help us grow spiritually. How can we ever learn to love the unlovely if everybody we're around is nice to us? That's not unconditional love. Don't expect every day of your life to be perfect. Now, I'm not saying you got to go around and believe for trouble all the time, but don't, don't be shocked when things are inconvenient. So Joseph went from living a nice little life. He was the youngest. 
Daddy's favorite. You know, the babies are always the favorite. He went from that to slavery, to prison, to being put in a position to save a nation. You notice he had to leave comfort, go into misery, to be in a position where he could save a nation. Come on, let's do it again. He went from comfort <laughs> to unjust, unfair treatment, very uncomfortable. He had to go through that stage to grow him up enough to get him to the point where he could save a nation. When God called me into ministry, well, first of all, I was not doing anything special. I was making my bed. And I had three teenagers at the time and basically was just trying to survive life, you know. I loved God and we went to church every week. And, uh, but I, I didn't act like much of a Christian. I mean, I was very immature and always mad and upset about something. And I would have been your least likely candidate probably to be called to preach, but God knows things about us. He not only sees where we're at, but he sees where we will be. And you know, let me just throw in here that we, we need to be willing to look at more people that way. Not just look at where they're at right now, but what their potential is if somebody will love them unconditionally, pray for them, and stick with them through some stuff. Amen? You know, Dave was dating three girls when he met me and he was praying for a wife. I always say Dave definitely believed that faith without works is dead, so. <laughs> he was believing for a wife, but he was dating everything that moved, and so. <laughs> when, when he met me, we had five dates and got married. I don't recommend it, but. I always say that he had to marry me before he found out what he was really getting or would have never worked. So, I mean, I, I, was, I was hard to deal with. I'd been abused and divorced and didn't trust anybody. And, I mean, I can actually tell you when I married Dave, I could never remember ever being really happy in my life or ever feeling safe. And so, I just had a lot of wounds and a lot of hurts, and man, if he, if he would have done things like so many people do today, if you're uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, you're incompatible, I, who is compatible? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, who marries somebody and says, oh, I, I just like everything you do, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's just fantasy. And so, you know, you get along because you choose to get along. And you get along because you decide that you don't have to have your way all the time and that you're going to do what God wants you to do, not what you feel like doing. And so, if Dave would have been more concerned about his comfort than doing what he felt like God wanted him to do, I probably wouldn't be here today doing what I'm doing. Because somebody had to not just tell me about Jesus, somebody had to be Jesus in my life. And I'll tell you, I didn't change overnight. It took some time. And so many things, when God called me into ministry, there were so many hard things that I went through. I mean, we lost all of our friends. We got asked to leave our church. We had to find different schools for our kids because they went to, to school at church and, and people that I loved and trusted turned against me and talked about me and man, I didn't understand all that. I was just trying to be a good girl and do what I felt like God wanted me to do. You ever feel like that? Well, I'm just trying to do what I think is right and I feel like all hell's broken loose on me. Come on, do you ever feel that way? It's like, well, see, we expect that if we do what's right, that we should get rewarded right away. <laughs> but that doesn't always happen that way. Those who diligently seek God <laughs> will receive a reward in due time, in due time. Well, now I look back, I didn't understand. Oh man, I did not understand. 
I mean, family members turned against us. It, it was a tough time. I tell Dave sometimes, I don't really even, other than the grace of God, I don't know how I even had the ability to keep saying yes to God with everything that I was losing. You have to understand back when I started doing this, I mean, women in ministry were just like very unpopular. There just wasn't that many people. But I look back now and I was so dependent on people and what they thought of me and I got my worth and my significance from people. And I'm telling you what, God had to kick every prop out from under me and teach me how to get rooted and grounded in Him. So maybe you're someplace right now where you don't, it's not convenient, it's not comfortable, you don't want to be there. Well, let me make a new suggestion to you. Instead of begging God to get you out of there, why don't you just say, God, when you're ready to move me to another place, I trust that you will. But in the meantime, teach me whatever it is I need to learn while I'm here and use me for your glory while I'm in this place. You know how much more you would enjoy? You can enjoy being in hard places if you have the right attitude. How many of you need to hear what I'm saying this morning? All right. Because I'll quit if you don't want to hear it. Well, probably I won't, but. Okay, so now Joseph has gone through all this stuff and it's been really hard. He's in prison for 13 years for something that he did not do. He helped the baker and the butler get out of prison. I asked them to remember him. They, of course, they forgot all about him. He stayed in prison. But you know, when God has a plan for your life, no matter what people don't do for you, come on now, when God is ready to make a move, nobody will stop him. And listen, part of Satan's plan is to get us all messed up with bitterness and unforgiveness. So he arranges for people to hurt us hoping we'll get all messed up inside so then we never end up getting what God wants us to have because now we're out of sorts with God. But if you can just continue doing what God tells you today to do, when your time, listen to me, when your time for promotion comes, no man on earth and no devil in hell can keep you from what God has for you. So we just need to stop blaming people and just secretly look at them and say, Behind, under your breath, no matter what you do to me, you cannot keep God from blessing me. <laughs> God's got a plan for you. So it's the end of the whole thing now. Joseph has gotten out of prison. He's gotten favor with Pharaoh because he interpreted a dream for him. And Pharaoh trusts him so much that he's put him in charge of all the food and they were facing, they'd already had two years of famine and were facing five more. And so if anybody wanted anything to eat, they had to get it from Joseph. So his father and his brothers, the brothers who sold him into slavery, they're living somewhere else now, not in Egypt and they're hungry and they hear that there's food there. So they went got an appointment with Joseph, not knowing that he was the brother whom they had mistreated. So starting in Genesis 45, verse one, it says, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? And his brothers could not even answer him for they were dismayed, or you might say afraid at his presence. They thought, well, now we're gonna get what's coming to us. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. But now watch this. 
And now do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. So he's basically saying, you thought you were sending me here, but the only reason you sent me here was because God wanted me here and he had a purpose. So let me tell you something, even in some of the things that happen that seem so unbelievably unfair and unjust, God can still have a purpose and we need to remember God is in control of my life, not you. Verse six, for the famine has been in the land these two years and there are five years yet to go where we will neither plow nor harvest. And God sent me, somebody say, God sent me. <laughs> Maybe you're at a job right now where you're the only believer and people don't treat you right and you know they're making fun of you and judging you and you absolutely hate the place and can't wait to get out of there. Maybe what God's trying to say to you today is, stop it, I sent you there. <laughs> Come on, I hear somebody that's semi-happy. What makes us think that God couldn't possibly have sent me there if I'm not comfortable? Yes, God wants to bless us, but there's other things he wants to do besides that. He wants to use us, and I, I just might as well tell you, if you are going to be used by God, you are going to be persecuted. I said, if you're going to be used by God, you are going to be persecuted. Not everybody's gonna clap and cheer because you wanna do some great thing for God. <laughs> well, I still got a few people smiling, that's good. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to keep alive many survivors so that it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me a father to Pharaoh and a Lord of all of his house and a ruler over all the land of Egypt. You know, I don't have time to do this, so I won't get into it, but I could go back to my own story. I mean, I prayed for God to get me out of that situation and he didn't. Now, I don't think God's an abuser and I don't think he arranged for my father to abuse me, but he could have gotten me out of the situation much sooner than what he did. And God had a plan all along. He wanted to use me to expose what was going on behind closed doors in so many places. As far as I know, I was one of the first people to start really talking about incest and sexual abuse. And you know, I've got this, and I believe it is a gift from God. I mean, I am extremely open about my life and usually anybody else's life that has anything to do with me. And uh, so people always say, you just need to know if you're gonna hang out with Joyce, you're probably gonna get talked about in the pulpit. And so because I have this gift of being so honest, I was able to tell that story and tell it in a way that set so many people free. So the devil thought, come on, the devil may think that he's got you somewhere where he's ruining you and destroying you, but little does he know it's the springboard for your promotion in life. Amen. Now there's so many, many, many examples. There's two things that we all have. One of them is one of these. We, we wear that because we don't want to be bothered. You know, don't bother me. And then we all have an excuse bag. We've all got one of these. So if somebody gets past the don't bother me, we've got an excuse ready for, the, for God. Let's see, I mean, we have just got so many. I, I've got a bunch. Well, God, I don't know how to do that. That's the first thing I said when he called me to teach. I don't know how to teach. He said, I know, but I do. 
If you just had any idea how dumb I was when I started this, you would spend the rest of the day rolling around the floor laughing. I mean, I have no idea how I got from where I was to where I am, but here we are. Well, God, this is not, that's not what I had planned. I can't do that. I'm not ready for this yet. <laughs> Maybe another time. I have too many personal problems of my own. Boy, that is a big one. <laughs> I, you know, well, God, I, I'll increase my giving next time I get a raise. No, God doesn't want you to wait for a time where you can give it and not miss it. Maybe he wants your vacation money. Well, I've been saving that for three years. I, I've got a plan. Why, God's not mean. Why would he take my vacation money? Come on, if you're believing for something big, you might as well get ready to sow big, and you might as well get ready to sow sacrificially. My gosh, do I admire people who will do what God tells them to do, even when it makes no sense at all to them. And what if you never ever, while you're breathing, make any sense out of it? It still is just good to obey God. I don't know anybody who's ever done this before. This is the favorite. Boy, it's just too hard. I have no experience. I have nobody to help me. I don't have any money. I'm afraid. I don't feel like it. Come on, you got one of these. Maybe it's not like mine. I mean, you may not see it like you see mine, but how many of you know we've got excuses? You know, is anybody getting this? Because I'm about out of time. God uses your journey to prepare you for the assignment that he's given you. Stop making excuses. That's the message today. Stop making excuses and just do what God tells you to do. Can anybody say amen? This program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. The test of faith. We don't get what we want the moment that we want it. God leads us the long, hard way because many times we're not ready for the thing that God's got ready for us. This morning, I want to talk to you about being interrupted by God. <laughs> yes. Well, we can kind of see that everybody needs that, right? You know, um, most of us have some kind of a plan for the day. I mean, I know there are people who just kind of fly by the seat of their pants and they never know what they're going to do, but, you know, most of us have some kind of a plan. and. How about if we start the day by lifting our plan up to God and saying, now this is what I have planned, but I just want you to know I'm available for you. And if at any time you need to interrupt my plan because you need me to do something else, then please help me hear you and be quick to obey. How many of you think that sounds good? You know, I always say that if you want to be used by God, you don't need ability, you just need availability. You'd be amazed how many people think they can't do anything for God because they can't find any special talent they have, but God can give you the talent 
to do whatever he wants you to do if you're just available. Interrupted by God. God rarely asks us to do anything when it's convenient. Actually, when he calls, he seems to not care too much at all about what we're doing. Because whatever we're doing is not as important as what God wants us to do. I must say that one more time. Whatever we're doing is not nearly as important as what God wants us to do. Amen. So, Paul told Timothy to preach the gospel in season or out, whether it was convenient or inconvenient. But there's a little something else I want you to see about 2 Timothy 4 too, because I think in some instances we've gotten a little bit off track and if we go to church and we hear anything other than something that just makes us feel good, then we don't like the sermon. But Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out, reprove, which means correct, rebuke, which means correct a little bit harder, <laughs> and exhort, which means to edify and make people feel good about themselves. But I tell you, if, if, if you go to a church where your behavior is never confronted and where you can always just be really comfortable, I think sometimes, well, I kind of enjoy making people squirm in their seats a little bit. You know, it's kind of, you, you can kind of tell when you're saying something that people would really rather not hear. But you know, it's the stuff that we would rather not hear that we need to hear. And you know, most people who teach or preach, they love it when people say amen or they're shaking their heads. And Dave always tells me, don't be so concerned about everybody clapping and saying amen about everything you say. They clap for the stuff they already know and agree with when they're quiet. Come on. When they're quiet, you're saying something that's kind of like, uh-oh, <laughs> am I understanding this right? You know, a lot of times when God begins to deal with us about something that is going to be a little bit uncomfortable for us, we, we tell God, oh, no, not that. I'm, I'm not ready for that yet. But whatever God wants to deal with us about, there's an anointing at that time for God to deal with us about that thing. And many times we want to wait for our own timing and then things can be really, really, really difficult. You know, after we're born again, our number one job is to grow up. <laughs> Amen? And we need more mature Christians and mature Christians are stable. They're not up and down and all over the place based on what their circumstances are doing. And mature Christians are very prompt about obeying God because they know that God is smarter than they are and that His way is always best. Well, Felix was a man who'd been hearing about the gospel and hearing about Paul in particular, and he wanted to learn more. And so in Acts 24, 25, it says, and as he reasoned, Paul went to him and he says, and he reasoned with him about righteousness, which I guess challenged Felix's behavior, and about self-control, and he tried to talk to him about the upcoming judgment. You see, I think we need to be reminded more often that the day will come for every one of us, not some of us, every one of us, when we will stand before God and give an account of our life. The day will come for every one of us. And I think we need to think about that sometimes. When we will stand before God and give an account of our lives. Now, obviously, if we're true believers in Jesus Christ, this judgment is not going to be about whether or not we're going to get into heaven. But I think for Christians, it's important what we do with our time. I think it's important how we treat people. How many of you think that 
how you treat people is important to God. Can I tell you something? I think it's the most important thing to God. I think the way we treat other people, especially people who can't do anything for us, especially people who can't do anything for us, I think it says more about our character than probably anything else. We need to get about the business of loving one another and not just talking about loving one another. Amen? So I guess in a way today is a little bit about calling all of us to a higher level of obedience. And uh, obedience really is always a sacrifice. It's some kind of sacrifice. If God asks me to do something for somebody, it's going to take some of my time. It's going to take some of my money. It's going to take some of my effort. If I want to grow tomatoes, which I don't, but if I did, (laughs) and I had a package of tomato seeds, I could not ever have a garden full of tomatoes unless I sacrificed my seed. And so, seed, of course, can be money, it can be time, but I believe that every act of obedience or disobedience is a seed that we sow that will bring a harvest in our life. It'll either bring a harvest that we really like or it will bring a harvest that we don't like. The word convenient, and let me just say that I think in our society we're pretty addicted to convenience and comfort. Does anybody agree? I said to my daughter two or three months ago, I said, you know what I've realized about myself? She said, what? I said, I really don't like to be uncomfortable. Most of us, you know, we just, we're just not always very tough. You know, you go to some of these other places like third world countries or developing countries and, and I mean, the things that they don't have, and many of them are happier than we are with all the stuff that we've got. Matter of fact, one of the things we complain about is all the stuff we have that we have to take care of. So, um, we need to get ready to obey God quickly and do whatever it is He wants us to do. In Ecclesiastes 11.4, it says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. And really what that is basically saying is if you, when God asks you to do something, if you won't do it unless all of your circumstances are perfect, then you'll never end up sowing. And if you don't sow, you'll never end up reaping. So we, we need to get the understanding that God purposely puts us in positions very often in life where we won't like it, and it's not convenient, and it's not comfortable, And even though we do not understand the purpose, there is a purpose for what God is doing. And it's usually got something to do with our spiritual growth. Now, I'll tell you a story. There was a great preacher around the turn of the century called Billy Sunday. Anybody ever hear of Billy Sunday? Okay. He was like the Billy Graham of that day. And he had been a professional baseball player. And um, he heard the gospel got saved and felt called to be an evangelist. And so he just became a great, great, great man of God. Now, leaving that there for a minute, there was a local pastor, pastor of a local church in Chicago, which is where Billy Sunday was also from. And one night he woke up in the middle of the night and felt like God was telling him to go down to the Chicago train station and preach in the middle of the night. Well, he thought, well, that's silly, and rolled over and went back to sleep, and it wasn't very long, and same thing happened again. And he thought, well, that's ridiculous. What sense does that make? Rolled over and went back to sleep, and in a few minutes woke up and still felt the same thing. I wonder how many times God gives us an opportunity to do something, but because we think it's silly, (laughs) 
or it doesn't make any sense, we just kind of blow it off and don't do it. Well, I guess the man was mature enough to finally realize it was God talking to him, and although it didn't make any sense at all, he gets up in the middle of the night, gets dressed, goes down to the train station, and he ends up actually one level below where the trains were running, and there was nobody down there, but he just preached a a gospel message, just a plain, basic gospel message. As far as he knew, he was not preaching to anybody, didn't see anybody, didn't hear anybody, went back home, went to bed, never had any idea why he was there or what was going on. Well, years later, he went to a Billy Sunday meeting, and Billy told how he was saved. And he said, yeah, one night, in the middle of the night, I was at the Chicago train station, and uh, I heard somebody preaching. I couldn't see him, but I heard him preaching the gospel. And that's when I received Christ, and God called me to be an evangelist. <laughs> so I want you to remember that when you're out and about, you are the hands and feet of Jesus. And I can tell you the work that needs to be done in the world is not going to be done by a handful of preachers on a platform. We have to train you up that you go out and do the work of the ministry. And so I'd like you to really just make a decision today that you're going to agree with God to be promptly obedient to what He tells you. And I'm not suggesting just doing stupid things without checking it out or, you know, if something sounds really weird, then I would pray about it more than once. But always remember, just because it doesn't make any sense to you doesn't mean that it's not God. Just because it doesn't make any sense to you doesn't mean that it's not God. We try to apply our human understanding to what we sense in our heart that God wants. But God's thoughts are above our thoughts, and His ways are above our ways. I remember a time when I was going to lunch with a friend, and I had another friend that I went to lunch with a lot. Her and I actually spent a lot of time together, and now I'm going to lunch with this other person, but I kept feeling like I should invite this other friend to go. And um, in one way, I really kind of wanted to spend some private time with this other friend, but because I really felt like it was God, I thought, okay. So I called her, and I asked her. Her name was Joan. I said, Joan, would you like to go to lunch with me and so-and-so today? She said, oh, I would love to. I appreciate you asking, but I'm spending the day with my mom. Well, I was a younger believer then, and so that kind of confused me. And I said to God, well, you know, I thought you, I felt so sure that you told me to ask her to lunch. He said, I did. I didn't tell you she'd go. I just told you to ask her. <laughs> Come on, is anybody ready to start obeying God, even if it doesn't really make a lot of sense to you? See, I believe that life can and should be and will be a real adventure if we really every day say to God, I'm available for you, whatever you want. It could be smiling at someone. It could be telling somebody that the color they've got on looks good on them. I don't think we realize how many people out in the world are desperate just to believe that somebody sees them. So. We're going to obey God, whether it's convenient or whether it's inconvenient. Now, let's look at a few people that God called at very inconvenient times and see how they responded. Oh, and by the way, do you know that as far as I can tell, every person that Jesus healed, he was on his way to do something else. Come on, I want you to understand that. He was headed to Jerusalem and blind Bartimaeus cried out, Jesus, thou son of David, help me. And the Bible says, the Amplified Bible says, and Jesus stood still. Don't you love that? He's going somewhere, and he stood still. 
I wonder how many times we're in a rush to get somewhere that's really not even all that important. And we pass by the man lying on the side of the road bleeding because we've got our plan and we don't want to be inconvenienced. Wonder how many more people we could help if we were willing to make a little bit of a sacrifice to do it. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Now, you know, we read this stuff and I don't think that we think that much about it, but if you really stop and think about this, how amazing is that? They didn't, I guess, didn't know who Jesus was. Maybe they'd heard about him. Maybe they hadn't heard about him. And I don't know, maybe we could say, well, there must have been something really special about Jesus that people would do that. But whatever the case is, they had a plan. These people were businessmen. They had fishing businesses. If we go on and read, verse 21 says, And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father (laughs) and followed him. They just walked off from everything. Like when God called Abram to leave everything that he knew and was comfortable with and go to a place that I will show you. He wouldn't even tell him where he was, where he was going to send him. And if we get around to it, you'll see. I mean, Abraham basically just wandered around for years and years. And, you know, he'd pitch a tent one place, and then pretty soon God would tell him to move, and he'd pitch a tent somewhere else, and God would tell him to move. And, you know, he's doing all this stuff because God had told him, if you'll do this, I'll bless you, and I'll make you a blessing. Well, how many of us are willing to wait for years. (laughs) The test of faith. We don't get what we want the moment that we want it. God leads us the long, hard way because many times we're not ready for the thing that God's got ready for us. God may have something really major for you to do, but maybe you're not spiritually mature enough yet to handle it. So God has to take you a couple of trips in the wilderness. Come on. Because we don't grow up in our good times. We grow up in hard times. That's when we do our growing. When it's inconvenient, when it's uncomfortable, when people are not treating us nice and we love them anyway when they keep hurting us over and over and because God said to, we forgive them, even though we don't think it's right or fair and it doesn't feel good, we need to start doing things just because God said to do it and we don't have to know why or when we're gonna get a breakthrough. Not everything that God asks us to do is convenient, but everything God asks us to do, he does give us the grace to do it. I always say that God gives you the grace for the place. Even like if you're raising a special needs child, I believe that God will give you the grace to do that. I know a young woman that has two special needs children, they're twins, and, and then she has two other boys. And it's, it's amazing what it takes for her to take care of all these kids. And you, you just, you look at people and you think, I don't know how you do it. I just don't know how you do it. Well, people do whatever God wants them to do by the grace of God, which means he gives us the ability to do it. Maybe right now you're you're in kind of a difficult marriage, but you, you believe God wants you to stick it out. Well, you know what? You don't have to be miserable and unhappy the whole time you're in that situation. If you're in the place God wants you to be in, then he'll give you the grace to be in that place And that means that you can be in an uncomfortable place and still have joy. Come on, there's somebody that I'm trying to talk to this morning. Can you not be comfortable 
and still be happy. <laughs> I see not too many heads going this way. You're kind of like, hmm. Now, while I'm not perfect at it either, remember I got the revelation a few weeks ago that I don't like being uncomfortable, so. If you don't need this message, I'll preach to myself. <laughs>